Thank you, Margie. Like Margie said, I'm James Sill. I'm a senior solution engineer, solution engineer with Esri um, out of our office in uh, the, on the Front Range in, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I predominantly work with our federal civilian and sciences team um, with land management and federal conservation. But a lot of what I do blends into a larger part of the federal government and large uh, geospatial organizations. Today, I'm going to discuss uh, automated feature extraction in ArcGIS. So this has to do with extracting information from imagery and enriching the data that you're collecting. As an overview of what we're gonna cover, um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about what is feature extraction in ArcGIS, is pulling out that information and, and feeding it to, to people within your organization to make better decisions. Uh, methods for, for conducting automated feature extraction. So the idea of unsupervised classification versus supervised classification. Uh, collecting and managing training samples for supervised classification, which is a, a substantial component of feature extraction. And finally, uh, in the methods section, I'm going to discuss deep learning in ArcGIS, which is a subset of feature extraction within the ArcGIS, ArcGIS ecosystem. And I'll cover some real life examples. So supervised classification of land cover with uh, using raster analytics and also integrating external deep learning frameworks. In this case, a model trained with TensorFlow back into ArcGIS to extract information from imagery collected over time for, for port monitoring. And you really can't talk about imagery and feature extraction and all of these anal all of this analytics within uh, Esri and ArcGIS without talking about enterprise GIS. So the whole point of extracting this information from the imagery is to feed it out to your organization, whether it's through a desktop application like Pro, an app, a web application, uh, viewing it through a web browser in ArcGIS Online or in Portal. And it allows you to enrich your enterprise GIS with information gathered from imagery and expose it to a larger audience. And imagery within ArcGIS is represented by these five key capabilities. I like to call them the five pillars. Uh, they cover everything from uh, management of imagery up in the right hand corner, which is a substantial component using mosaic data sets to manage this wealth of of remotely sensed data within your organization. Visualization and exploitation, so visualizing and ex extracting information from it, running analytics on, on the, that information, and producing maps out of it. So this the maps can then be distributed to your organization. And finally, this all ties together to produce content, content that enables your organization to make better decisions. And in ArcGIS, imagery it really integrates all types of remotely sensed content from oblique collected imagery to land cover classification which i'll be discussing change analysis uh, using uh, different views of imagery in in image space full motion video taking raw imagery from drones and feeding it all the way through the whole pi processing pipeline and producing real information products of it arcgis supports most all major sensors and is a platform to help you analyze and uh, distribute your, your, your remotely sensed data throughout your organization. And ArcGIS is a, it's a robust image management as well as analytics platform. And so here is a, just a, few of the key capabilities within ArcGIS. So mosaic, using mosaic data sets, image server, authoring processing chains through ArcGIS Desktop and Pro for automated analytics, which I'll be discussing uh, more in detail. ArcGIS has a wealth of tools for feature extraction from imagery. Uh, they they fall into several categories, one being classification. So classifying at the pixel and object level, what is what exists in, in, the, uh, in the image that you're feeding into to your, to the, to your application. This allows you to uh, have a better idea of what it, it exists on the Earth's surface without having to send boots on the ground. 
There's also the ability to conduct clustering, so bringing those pixel values into a, to a defined in a defined location and seeing where those the defined pixel values are greater than or equal to the, what is around it. And I'll be discussing this uh, brief briefly in a few minutes. And finally, this allows you to conduct things like prediction. So using this information to predict out uh, based on the Im information gathered. And finally, a more uh, a Another subset of the feature extraction tools has to do with deep learning. Deep learning is a quickly growing uh, component of feature extraction where the use of neural networks to train models and to apply those models to predict land cover, ob detecting objects and activity is becoming a greater and greater component of feature extraction. A lot of this is all falls under this idea of machine learning and We've done machine learning in ArcGIS for a long time, and a lot of it has been this, these traditional tools. So classification, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, so pixel and object-based classification, image segmentation, using uh, defined algorithms like maximum likelihood, random trees, and support vector machine, which are established algorithms to conduct feature extraction. There's the ability to, to conduct clustering. So if you don't have training data, you can use, you can, do, do spatially constrained multivariate clustering, density-based clustering, hotspot analysis. So you can really dig into an area of interest that you might not know, have a lot of information about. And finally, a lot of these tools also allow for prediction. So Imperial Bayesian Krieging, uh, interpolation, um, regression, and prediction. And finally, as I stated earlier, deep learning. You, ArcGIS represents a platform that has all of these tools to do end-to-end -end work, to conduct end-to-end -end workflows that apply deep learning algorithms. So you can generate your training samples, apply those training samples to it and train a model, detect objects, classify at the pixel level. And this is, it also offers the ability to apply at scale over large imagery collections, which I'll be discussing a little bit later. So when you talk about feature extraction at a, at a large scale, at an automated level, you really you really start with unsupervised. So what an unsupervised classification does is it allows you to go about classifying an image without applying training samples. So we in ArcGIS we have what's called ISO ISO clustering, which is built on a k-means nearest neighbor algorithm, which is a quick least cost classification method. It's great for instances where there's low familiarity with the composition of an area, especially for uh, lower resolution imagery where you don't know a whole lot of information about what's taking place in your area of interest. A little bit lower overhead in that you're not going to employ staff to collect training samples and spend a lot of time conducting those. Uh, uh, building those training data sets. And it also can provide an initial segmentation layer for future classification. So it can be another predictor variable to feed into a more sophisticated uh, algorithm like SVM or, or uh, random forest. Some of the advantages, like I said, it excels where there's a lack of resources that exist to create training samples. And some of the use cases that um, I've seen that have, have been uh, where uh, unsupervised classification has excelled is uh, flood extent mapping. So grabbing imagery where we know flooding has existed, flooding has taken place, uh, and measuring uh, the extent of that flooding. So delineating the damage to undamaged line. Uh, the presence absence of vegetation in a post wildfire burn zone. So as wild as the wildfire season occurs, we can measure the absence of vegetation by the spectral characteristics and differences within an image. All of this really excels as well when you have when your imagery possesses distinct uh, differences in spectral composition. So supervised uh, classification and supervised feature extraction relies on training samples. So you, your staff or you yourself will go and collect tr ground truth training samples of areas that you know are, that can be identified as a certain object or certain class of land cover or, uh, or characteristics on, in the image. And it assumes the user um, has the ability and the, the, 
the time to collect the training samples, and it is you and those training samples then can be fed into um, established algorithms like support vector machine, uh, forest based classification, which is the random forest algorithm within ArcGIS and maximum likelihood. ArcGIS represents a uh, platform to collect those training samples, manage those training samples, curate them, and uh, share them with your with your organization. Some of the instances where supervised classification excels, it's uh, when you do have the ability and time to create training samples. Um, some of the the use cases are multi-class land cover classification, which I'll be showing in just a little bit. Um, and for feature, feature identification and something like impervious and non-impervious surface mapping. If anyone's spent a lot of time in West, the Western U.S., specific, specifically in Western, Southwestern Colorado, knows that there's a lot of barren ground, but there's a lot of areas where there's uh, high levels of natural resource extraction. In Southwest Colorado, this is especially true, where areas like this, delineated in the red boundary, have <clears throat> grazing allotments, oil and gas leases, and What's contained on the surface has a great effect on how those those allotments and those leases are handed out to oil and gas companies, to commercial grazing, and to commercial farming. There's a need to be able to extract information from imagery that's collected over time, gain an idea of what's going on on the, on the surface and how it's changing. Here I'm going to start looking at, I'm going to examine the land cover characteristics in this area of interest to, to measure the growth and the decrease of, of uh, sagebrush, which is a key indicator of sage grouse, a threatened species, which has a high influence on whether oil and gas leases are handed out. To initially dig into this imagery and conduct, conduct unsupervised classification, We simply define an area of interest. Here I'm going to extract bands to, to get a greater degree of the spectral differences in the image. And going in this, into this fresh without a lot of information on the surface, I just want to see the, the spectral differences within, within the, my area of interest. I can use the image classification wizard and use ISO clustering where I have the opportunity to either choose supervised or unsupervised. I can apply this algorithm to the image at the, at the local pro project level, or if I'm connected to a portal with image server and raster analytics, I can submit this as to distributed processing on the server. I can then define other parameters, and I can run this submitting it on the server. And here you see it populating across the screen. And I can see the, the key spectral differences within this, cl within this uh, clustering algorithm. Now this gives me a character characteristics of the, difference, of the spectral differences within the image, but I want to classify all of the, of the different classes of land cover within my area of interest and apply a more robust machine learning algorithm. To do this, I would start in the training samples manager. The training samples manager offers an easy to use interface to collect training samples, manage them, and then, then use that as a way to submit them into the training of your model. I simply select a, a, a class from my schema. Identify the different objects, so pinion pine and sagebrush 
And if anybody's been to Southwest Colorado, then they know that there's a lot of sagebrush. And then I can review the training samples. I can save them to a to a feature service within my pro project. And then I can use a raster function that calls the support vector machine or random forest algorithm, supply my training samples. And again, I have the option to either run this locally and create an output tied to my pro project or submit it to image server for distributed processing. Here you see the classified output with blue indicating bare ground, red indicating sagebrush habitat, and then green indicating coniferous and pinyon pine. So I have a good snapshot of what's taking place with this particular uh, collection of NAEP imagery collected in 2017, but how, what do I want, how do I do it if I wanna view this over time? With image server and operating on image services, I can bring in a whole stack of, of uh, NAEP layers over time in my area of interest. I can feed these in to the, to the ArcGIS Python API, which exposes all of the raster functions like the classify function. I can supply a list of image services, and I can process all of those against the server. I can mask those to extract the, the, the feature that I care most about, which in this case is sagebrush. I can look at how that surface is changing over time. And I can have a good, I get an idea of the extent of sagebrush cover within my area of interest for a particular year. Where ArcGIS really excels with, with imagery is how this data published automatically as a, as a hosted image service to, to, a, to organization's image server can then be integrated into your organization's GIS. I can bring in active, lease, active leases in Southwest Colorado. And I can use existing geoprocessing tools to tabulate the area of, different, of the different classes within my area of interest and join that back to my lease layer. I can get a gauge of how much things are changing over time and start to understand the different components that exist within these leases. Like I said, this is incredibly important for environmental assessment and how leases are, how it's decided how, how leases will be awarded. And what's more, because all of this exists within my enterprise GIS, I can feed it into something like Insights, where I can start to dig into the different, to the different components and the spatial distribution of, of, the, of the growth of sagebrush cover within specific PLSS boundaries. as well as understand the leases that are at the greatest risk of, of environmental damage. What's more, I can feed all of this into an easy to use web application so environmental screening can take place. A quick assessment of selected leases can occur. And then I can allow my users 
to summarize their areas of interest within the land cover classification layer that I published. So that's just a quick overview of some of the tools that are available within ArcGIS to extract the features that you're looking for, understand how they're dispersed within your area of interest, and feed them out to, to people who are doing environmental screening and assessing uh, land cover and environmental, envi environmental conditions for, uh, for the end user. And this really represents a end-to-end -end cycle where training data is collected, Im imagery is accessed, imagery is prepared, training data is collected, models are trained, a feedback loops exist, and then we rely on distributed processing to, to compute the, the changes and the classification at scale. This allows us to derive products and get the information into stakeholders' hands. And this really, it starts with imagery management. So creating a mosaic data set out of your imagery, uh, relying on that structure that ArcGIS provides, using the labeling tools and preparing the data, training or fitting the model, predicting with the images, creating derivative outputs, and finally running further analytics on that, that those outputs that can support, uh, to, that provide decision support, uh, information for field staff to go out and verify and conduct further assessment and for overall environmental monitoring. In the just the short time I've been at Esri, deep learning has become uh, a really growing approach to feature extraction, uh, not only within ArcGIS but all across the, the remote sensing and imagery space. Deep learning is, it's, if you're new to it, it's a, it's, there's a lot to take in and there's a lot of different components of it and a lot of things to understand. And if, if you look at, if you break it down into four different types of deep learning and how they're approached in ArcGIS, it's, it's a little bit more consumable. So you start with pixel classification. So identifying each pixel and what they are. So something would be like impervious surface classification. Another example would be object detection. So um, a use case would be actual ag agricultural crop detection and assessment. So defining an object on the Earth's surface and with training samples and then detecting those objects. And I'll be covering a workflow that discusses this here shortly. Another one is in instance segmentation where, some, where you wanna do something like uh, extract building footprints. And finally, uh, it would be image classification. So extracting those objects or those segmentations and then assessing them for their characteristics and defining them. So if something like damaged house classification after a natural disaster. Where deep learning really excels is if you have the resources to create and maintain robust training data sets. This is really vitally important. Deep learning will consume every bit of training data and use it to its fullest. You also, it's beneficial to have access to GPUs, and I put a little smiley face in that if you have access to GPUs to train and apply your model, you'll have a, you will have a smile on your face. It allows for a higher level of, of uh, feedback, quicker training of a model, trip, quicker troubleshooting, and more cycles to produce and perfect a model. Also, you need a well-defined problem and a general knowledge of the area. And you know the problem you're trying to solve and you have metrics that describe what success would look like. And finally, and this gets into more of the kind of the nitty-gritty remote sensing world, the, the imagery collected is under consistent conditions with minimal variations in quality. So similar sensors uh, collected with the same sun angle and different co composition components, the same bit depth. This really allows for a, a cleaner and a easier process of training the model and a better model output at the end. And this really excels, again, uh, continued is it, 
with large-scale monitoring problems. There's a need to repeatedly measure the activity, composition, and change in a particular area over time. So being able to pull in imagery collected over a time series and apply a model to each stack of imagery to extract what's going on in the surface and seeing how it changes. Changes. Like I said, monitoring and identifying changes in land cover over time is a is a great application of, for deep learning. Um, object detection, so counting specific objects which can indicate activity and uh, and uh, other other important important information that you're trying to glean. And finally, the classification of those detected objects, so damaged or undamaged houses after a natural disaster. So the wealth of information and imagery that's collected over time, especially by the federal government, there's the ability now to not only identify what's going on in a snapshot on the Earth's surface, but to actually measure that over time, over multiple different collections of imagery. In this, in this scenario, I'll be looking at port activity, most, most <laughs> focusing on the number of shipping containers coming into a port. This is one meter image, high resolution imagery collected over a test area in, in the, at the port of Oakland, but it could be anywhere in the world. Like the initial workflow that I showed with supervised classification, the workflow is, it, it starts in a very similar place. ArcGIS Pro offers an incredibly easy to use tool to collect training samples. by simply dropping a, a point on examples of what you're trying to detect, saving those out to a feature class, exporting that training data to a deep learning framework. In this case, I'll, I've used TensorFlow to train the model, but this, this training can actually be conducted within ArcGIS Pro. I, I can supply a classified raster or an input feature class, in this case, my labels. Select a buffer radius. Select the format that I want to export the image chips as. Delineate where, if, if I'm in map space, image space, or pixel space. And then provide the metadata format that I'm going to export the training data as. In this case, Pascal visual object classes. I hit run and export this. And this data, these chips and these labels can then be fed into a deep learning framework. I can go about training my model. and then use my model to detect objects. I provide an input raster. I provide a name for the output feature class. And then I provide a model definition file. The model de definition file is a JSON file containing metadata that points to not only your, your, uh, your trained model, but also different components in the metadata. I can provide an, an extent 
and simply hit run. So what this does is it uses the train model, it applies that model, and it predicts the location of the objects that it's been trained on. Now this automatically results in a new feature class that is loaded into the map. Now I've detected the objects that I'm looking for and I can apply this to the whole imagery collection. Now this gives us, again, a snapshot of what's going on on the surface the day of this collection, but what I really wanna do is measure this over time. Between ArcPy and the Python API, we can do this by feeding our collections of imagery, this, this time into the ArcPy Detect Objects uh, tool, which I just, just showed in, in, as, a, as a GP tool in the user interface. I can automate this, throw my stack of images at it, grab those, result, those resulting feature classes, and publish those to, to my inter, ArcGIS Enterprise organization. I can then feed those into something like a dashboard where I can have a, a picture of, ha, of, what, of, of monitoring and what's happening in this particular port. and the percentage change in activity per collection. I can get a gauge of, the, of how quickly the activity is changing over these three different collections. And I get a good picture of how, it, how conditions are changing and how activity is changing. I can even pinpoint areas of the port that are, that are lacking activity or gaining activity over the dates of my collection. So this really represents a, a paradigm shift with, in remote sensing and the, the tools that ArcGIS has really support this paradigm shift where we're seeing collections of these massive collections of imagery coming into to federal organizations and it's giving them the ability to measure, to not only detect change, but it's a transition into true monitoring. So this allows you to apply these models over massive collections of imagery harvest information out of them, feed them into web applications so stakeholders can make decisions. So deep learning in ArcGIS, it really supports this end-to-end -end cycle. So it has these, all of these tools for labeling training samples, uh, preparing data to train models. So the, the tools to, to clean the data and to, to construct the schemas how you need them to be to be to exist training the models so whether it's in an external framework or within arcgis.learn uh, library it's the ability to put all of this can exist within a pro project <laughs> 
And finally, running inferencing. So the ability to apply that model to massive collections of imagery and scale it. And it supports all four deep learning categories. All of this supports image space and it heavily leverages the GPU. So a mach machines with, a G with GPU uh, capabilities, this framework really excels. And the clients that supported, and I've showed uh, some of these is through Pro. Pro is a very mature image imagery analysis workstation through the Map Viewer. So some many of these tools can be run through the Map Viewer and Pro. And finally through Notebooks, which I heavily leverage with the with both uh, workflows that I showed. Many of these tools are part of the image ArcGIS Image Analyst extension, and all of them can run just in a distributed manner on ArcGIS Image Server with Raster Analytics. And this really, it, and I've showed a similar slide earlier, but it's, it's good to emphasize that ArcGIS is a real machine learning uh, platform where you can, the professional, GIS professionals can use the tools in ArcGIS Pro, in notebooks, in the web viewer to create training samples, manage their imagery, feed those in to, uh, to a training engine, train models, produce models, apply those models with and on many different frameworks and supporting many different algorithms, and then produce uh, results, information products that can be in many people's hands within your organization and serve out to the public. And then just real quick before we move on to questions and we will share this slide is that there's an immense amount of training resources that are available to to users uh the top bullet is uh is the overview of deep learning tools within arcgis pro there is uh a, a whole overview of the image classification wizard which is the a really um easy to use uh interface for conducting for creating training samples uh, and then running running uh, uh, classification algorithms. And there's uh, two really great learn lessons that I'll point you to. One is detecting impervious surfaces from imagery, so applying an SVM classifier to, uh, to sub one meter imagery. And finally, extracting palm tree health from a palm, palm tree grow, uh, plantation in the Southwest Pacific. And Margie, I think I'm ready to open it up for questions. Great, we have quite a few in the queue. Um, I think we'll start with um, a baseline one that someone posed. It is, okay. what is GPU? A GPU is a graphic processing unit. Uh, many computers have them now, but some do not. So it, it allows for, uh, Pro uses it for visualization often, but it also can be leveraged to for uh, high-end computation. So training neural networks rely on a on a lot of processing power, and it can offer that. Great. Um, next question: How do you know how many training samples are required or needed, and how do you know when you have enough? <laughs> through iterating through the through the uh, training and model model uh, construction process. So, uh, a lot of these models will um, they will consume as much as you can give it. Now, there's some things about overfitting a model to a to a certain um, schema, but uh, with deep learning, especially, um, there's the, it it does it will consume every single. It's a it's a hungry algorithm. It's it's gonna it's gonna consume everything that you give it. Uh, at a certain point with with random forest and uh, and SVM so support vector machine there is a threshold where training samples are not going to it's not going to give you much more um, it's a trial and error sort of uh, approach the nice thing about SVM and and uh, and random forest is that the the model fitting is a fairly quick process especially if you can run it on image server so you get some feed, instant feedback on how it applies and that those models, those classification schemes can be applied uh, on the fly. So you get some pretty instant feedback on the, the, uh, the um, accuracy of your classification scheme. 
Great, next question. Can I use my own cloud provider? Uh, yes, depending on the cloud provider. Yep, yep. So uh, all of the data that I showed is all, the data that I showed today is all hosted in Amazon. Uh, and the model for the deep learning training was trained in Azure on a GOAI uh, virtual machine. Great. Next is what frameworks other than TensorFlow can be used? So we support TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras. Uh, let's see, there's more there, uh, CNTK. Uh, and then there's also the ability to, um, we use a, Pro comes with these with a set of Python raster functions, which are adapters for those model frameworks. So that's built in. You have the ability to write your own Python raster function that can hook into your own algorithm. It takes uh, a little bit of, I think, understanding how Pro consumes pixel data and how it classifies things, but that's the approach that you would take if you're gonna roll your own. But um, so it's, again, it's, it's ArcGIS Learn, which is built on PyTorch and FastAI. Uh, we, we support those two on their own, PyTorch and FastAI, TensorFlow, CNTK, and Keras, which is the backbone of a, some of the other frameworks that I've talked about. Great, and we have had a few questions about getting the slides or the recordings, and we will be setting that out um, once everything's set up and available. All right. Um, we also had a couple questions about dealing with false positives um, and moreover, kind of having um, the capability to go in as a person and identify what's correct and what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a, a whole um, workflow that I didn't just for the sake of time didn't really discuss as much, which is the um, it's a validation workflow. So you can go in, identify false, false positives, um, and then adjust your your training feature class, and then reapply and tweak your model from there. Reapply the parameters that you're you're uh, you've supplied it. Great. And then we had a specific question about the container example. Um, mm -hmm. We had a couple questions around the same issue. Um, does the deep learning generalize the container identification that is a rectangular object identified versus categorizing each container? Um, it, in, this, in this algorithm, it just uh, generalized. Yep. Yep. You would have the ability to within your labeling and I didn't do it with this particular one. It's kind of a, I did it all myself in that um, I created the labels just as a Boolean. Yes, it's a, yes, it's a, um, a container, put a dot on it. You can, uh, and this is the one approach that's been taken with uh, some of the work we've done with disaster response is that you can go in and within your training data, creating your training data, not only identify the object that you're, you want to, fine but also classify it so uh, big container small container that that sort of approach or damaged house undamaged house partially damaged great uh, next question is there a minimum uh, specification for the type of images you use on the detection of objects there's no minimum, I and mean, we've done we did a lot of work with detecting oil pads in southeast New Mexico uh, with uh, nine meter uh, nine meter sentinel data. So um, obviously that's a lot of wiggle room there. So it depends on the object you're trying to look at and the um, and how clear it is and how the what the pixel variations are that can that the model can use to represent that that object. Here I use pretty high resolution imagery because I have I did approach this with some other data sets from Maxar and because the older data sets had a, basically the resolution wasn't good enough to, to really identify the objects that I was looking for. So I used higher, higher resolution aerial imagery collected over, over a few months. Great, and I think the last question for today, um, how can drone data be fed into the Mosaic data sets and what image management options are available uh, specifically for drone data? So it, the nice thing is it's Mosaic data sets are agnostic and uh, they will consume 
and load in your 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 pixels um, regardless of the platform. So it obviously, it has to be a file type that we like, that we recognize within ArcGIS. Uh, we recognize most of them. There are most whereas a TIFF, GeoTIFF, MRF, uh, JPEG, 2000. Um, so drone imagery, once it's processed and orthorectified, it, especially with drone to map, it, you automatically get a mosaic data set out of it, and that structure can be, then be used to publish an image service. The workflow for imagery management um, would, uh, it, especially for singular collections, so I have a drone, I go out and collect uh, my area, um, I come home and I publish that as a mosaic data set uh, after it's orthorectified. Another component of this is mosaic data sets are a catalog, have a cataloging structure. So if you have metadata that you need to associate, so I want to maybe I want to combine a whole uh, several days or years of drone collections or satellite imagery collections, I can identify each one of those images with a collection date and other metadata to um, be able to query against it and delineate that image and measure that image compared to other images collected over time. So it's a, it, there's a lot of options within imagery management, but uh, that's a long way of saying that mosaic data sets offer the structure to be able to, to push your data into it, uh, catalog it, organize it, and then publish it out as an image service. Great. And we actually had a couple more imagery related questions pop in. Okay. Um, one is about color balancing and stitch lines and imagery. How does that affect the workflow? Uh, it, for classification, it can heavily affect it. Um, I, there was, I have some, a few artifacts in the overviews of the, uh, First set of first set of NAEP data um, at low res at zoomed in resolution. So the, that native resolution um, it can have an effect for classification object detection for deep learning. It's not I haven't seen it be much of an issue, but uh, for classification seam lines can can if they're present at native resolution, then um, they can present some problems that you have to to manage. Great, and then. Did you mention that both oblique and near nadar imagery can be used? Yes, yes. For for we support both of those with in deep learning. Yep. Great. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, James, for taking the time to explain some of these really interesting topics to us. And thanks everyone for attending and spending your time with us. Have a great day.